Third cranial nerve. The immediate two words that you will have to remember is down and out. Okay. Down and out is the characteristic appearance of third nerve because all the muscles except lateral rectus and superior oblique are paralyzed. All right. So the action of lateral rectus is outward movement and superior oblique is downward movement and that is what you will see. We have also seen that LPS is also supplied by the third cranial nerve so there is ptosis as well. All right. And the most common cause is uncontrolled hypertension. Now there are two types of third cranial nerve palsy. The first one is a medical type. It is due to uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. Okay. It is a pupil sparing type because the superficial parasympathetic fibers that are located in the third nerve, see the parasympathetic fibers are located like this superficially. These are not affected in medical conditions. So the pupil is spared that is the pupillary reactions are normal. However, in a surgical third cranial nerve palsy, you will see that suppose there is a mass compressing the nerve like this. The parasympathetic fibers will be affected first causing the pupil to dilate. So this is a pupil involving type of third cranial nerve. Okay. So an important flowchart over here. The third cranial nerve palsy when you see an down and out eye along with ptosis you have to immediately look at the pupil. If it is normal there is nothing to worry. It's check the diabetes or hypertension and correct them. However, if the pupil is dilated, immediately order an imaging and further management. Okay. Now, let's look at fourth cranial nerve. The patient complains of diplopia in downward and inward gaze. That is when he is reading or walking downstairs, he has a diplopia. Most commonly, it's seen in children. That's a congenital condition. In adults, if at all it's seen, it occurs due to trauma and you can see from this picture the eye is in and up just opposite to the cranial nerve palsy in and up eye and the head is tilted to the opposite side right head is always tilted in the opposite direction now there are a few peculiarities about the fourth cranial nerve that you will have to memorize usually asked in the exam it's the longest intracranial nerve with a course of 75 millimeters seven and a half centimeters and it is the thinnest and the first to rupture in any type of closed head injury right any trivial injury because it is so long and thin it's easy to get injured it is the only cranial nerve to cross to the opposite side that it means the fourth nerve of left supplies the superior oblique of the right side okay and it is the only cranial nerve coming from the dorsal surface all the cranial nerves come from the ventral surface right this is the only one which comes from the dorsal surface these are some peculiarities about the fourth cranial nerve now let's look at sixth cranial nerve palsy it's a lateral rectus is paralyzed we know that the sixth cranial nerve is supplied uh, supplies the lateral rectus right so, there is an unopposed action of the medial rectus. Am I right? So, there is a position of eye inwards and face outwards. That is the position in 6 cranial nerve palsy. Now, the important thing that you will have to think whenever you look at a lateral rectus palsy is the intracranial tension. Sixth cranial nerve may be a sign of increased intracranial tension. Also, Vice versa is that the most common nerve to be damaged in a case of increased intracranial pressure is your sixth cranial nerve patient presents with eye in and face out position. Now another condition the last one is your uh, paralysis of the neuromuscular junction nothing but the myasthenia gravis. Now, myasthenia gravis is seen in elderly people and young women. The first muscle to be paralyzed is levator palpebrae superioris. We know that as the day progresses, the myasthenia increases. The patient experiences more of the symptoms towards the end of the day. So the same thing applies to the eyes. There is a fluctuating ptosis and diplopia. That means by the end of the day, the amount of ptosis and diplopia will increase. 
right? As a characteristic of myasthenia gravis, we know that there are autoantibodies against the neuromuscular junction receptors. Another striking feature is the only skeletal muscles are affected. So only the extraocular muscles are affected and the intraocular muscles that is the ciliary muscle and the pupillary muscle are spared. That means the accommodation and pupillary actions are normal, right? Pupil and accommodation are normal. That is how you will differentiate it from the third cranial nerve palsy in which pupil is usually involved, right? Okay, and the drug of choice is pyridostigmin for myasthenia gravis. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sai Suguna, your mentor for ophthalmology at MediCoab. Now, thanks for watching the video. Now, we have put such videos all together in our ophthalmology app. The trial version you can download from the link over here or in the description box below.